All right, you bunch of yahoos, strap yourselves in for another episode of Dan and Don's Toxic Masculinity. In other words, shut up, sit up, and pay attention. And welcome back to another episode of Toxic Masculinity, where we are here to entertain, offend, defend anybody and everybody. So if you are a little, uh, you know, uh, on the stitchy side, better put on your man pants here because you're in, you're in for a, another big induction of masculine, toxic masculinity. With my co-host here, the predator Don Fry, yours truly Dan to be severed, and we have the special guest here right now. I'm not certain he needs actually probably three or four different introductions because we have, you know, I when Sybil, I first met him, Sybil, I, make it fast, right? <laughs> okay, when I first met him, I just knew him as Cactus Jack, but then then, then they came out to being this uh, mad kind, and then there's Dude Love, but he's simply known as Mick Foley, a, a man of very many different talents, writing books, children's books to, bo- to boot on top of that, so a man of many different facets, and, you know, we got just a mere hour with him, and uh, I don't think we're going to do him justice, but Mick, it's, it's uh, fantastic to have you in the house there with Don and myself. Well, I appreciate that, Dan. Uh, nice introduction. Yes, I was Cactus Jack when the two of us met. Uh, was either in, I know it was in Japan, but I, I'm not sure if we Kawasaki. met. Kawasaki. No, I, I, I go, the, the, we were talking about this before you ever, ever got there. I go, I go, I go, I got to tell this story. I said, the first time I ever met, met uh, again, I did did not know any of the other names. Yeah. I met this, this crazy guy by the name of Cactus Jack. <laughs> And I, I had never seen, I had never seen a thumbtack match before. Right. And your opening match at the Kawasaki Death Tournament Series was was a thumbtack match. So literally, I I I actually go out there and I, and I <laughs> you know hide behind the curtain. And I'm watching this match and I and I I, wa- I watch the referee sprinkle around uh, on the, the the mat what looks like thumbtacks. Right. Match, uh, thumbtacks, but I think it can't be can't be a real thumbtack. <laughs> but, but you're also you're in a ring. That uh, it's it's Bob Boyer, it's not it's not it's not a normal ring. It's it's actually Bob Bob Boyer that you guys have uh, for for ring ropes, and then you know you you, you do a match. Uh, you you wrestle like a, a Japanese wrestler. You guys go through it. It's all body slams, this that, crash bang, clotheslines, and crash bang boom, and falling down and, and the whole nine yards. And I'm thinking, okay, match is done. So I go back in, I sit down in my seat, and, and you come in, and you, you always wore like a shirt. Yeah, yeah. And so a couple of the young green boys, they come out there, and they, they kind of pull out, uh, pull out a shirt. And now I start hearing, you know, things that, metal things that are hitting the floor. And one or two of them rolled over towards me where I'm sitting, and I bent over, picked it up, and I'm going, and I'm thinking, my God, these are real. <laughs> and I remember the very first words I ever said to you, I like I, I said like, "Hey, cactus, how often do you get a tetanus shot?" You pause for a second, and go every year, Dan. Every year, I think. <laughs> well, it's at least he's being safe about it. He's being safe about it. So that was literally the first interaction I ever had with you. Was was uh, making that comment, and, and then even by later that night. When you and Terry Funk, you guys tore down the house, but then both of you still had to go to the hospital because you guys yeah. got third degree burns, second, cut up. Second so degree. This, second degree. Okay. Sec- okay. Sorry. I, <laughs> I, I was embellishing it just a little bit there. Okay. But no, it was, but, but even, the, even the following day, because at the we're airport, departing, yeah. the, we, we're departing the airport and you've got out a t shirt and you still have like little red dobbins. <laughs> Drip, drip marks because of all the puncture holes on your body. You're seeing this white T-shirt. And you see like l- l- like a little blood coming out here, a little blood coming out here. <laughs> you, you tore your ear up. Bad you case acne. Huh? You, <laughs> you got this big thing of gauze on the side of your head, <laughs> and then you got this this paper bag. And I think you almost look like a terrorist right now because you got all this hair and you got all this gauze and, and you got red doublets and you got the paper bag strapped to your chest. I think you know just it was it, yeah just, that was. That was some night. Uh, that was I've thought of like a one act play just on that one night because everything about it was just so surreal. So it's Dan's fir- first day in that company. When I was asking where we met, I knew we'd done the Japan tours together, and I knew your first tour was uh, with the Kawasaki Dream Tournament because Dan's the hottest free agent in in all of wrestling. And all of a sudden, he lands at IWA Japan. Like none of us could figure out what's he doing with us. We're the 
we're the blood and guts guys. You know, we're the garbage wrestling. You could have written, you could have written your own ticket, but uh, we were happy to have you there. But okay, but the okay, the funny thing about it is okay, there was two rings. There was the ring where I mean, literally all the other matches took place inside of this ring with the Bob Boyer net, and then there was I actually had a normal ring. Yep. And it it, it it did it did my my batch with with the Tarzan Goto there and, and I mean it was it was just it was crazy just to to be there thinking like going I really should be over here I'm supposed to be a, 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 a bad tough guy so I, I go I don't want to be in this Bob wire match I want to be with these thumbtacks I go ow this is gonna hurt <laughs> yeah it was it was, it was so it was uh, it was my first match was against Terry Gordy with the thumbtacks and then the, then it was the bed of nails second round with uh, with Shoji uh, Nakamaki. But when we did the press conference for this whole tournament, you know, I'm, I, Terry Gordy was one of the great pro wrestlers in history. It was one of those things where you would even ask guys who were on the tour with him with All Japan when he would have these great matches with, uh, um, oh, I'm try, trying to think. Uh, uh, I'm gonna, I can't believe I'm drawing a blank here. He was a great sumo sometimes, wrestler. Sometimes make the, when I start to think there, it just makes my head hurt. So I just I try not to do that anymore. You know? Well, he had great matches with Tenru and uh, the other guy. It will come to me. And I remember guys who were on that tour going, we think they're working together, but we're not sure because yeah. they that's the style they wrestled. And Gordy get all fired up, and he was one of the most realistic guys there was. But then he had, he, uh, had an overdose of some kind yeah. of pill on a flight to Japan. Uh, they had to revive, revive him, like bring him back to life, and he was never the same. So he goes from being one of all Japan's top two or three foreigners to, to you know, working regularly with us. I cut my promo, and I say, you know, I can't, I don't even know if I can do Cactus Jack anymore, but, uh, you know, Gordy, I'll give you all the props. You used to be one of the best in the world, but now you're stepping into my home, and what are you going to do when you come face-to-face -face with 10,000 thumbtacks? And then I, I finished my promo, and as we're walking out of the press conference, Gordy grabs me by the shoulder. He goes, "Bro, nobody told me anything about no thumbtacks." <laughs> <laughs> and I said, uh, "Don't worry, uh, Terry, we'll be okay." So we came up with creative ways for me to end up in there. And I think this is the only you know, thumbtacks, like everything in wrestling, you introduce them; they're awe-inspiring. And then within three, four years everybody's doing it right. but that was the one time i told terry i said when give me the bump i'm gonna sell my way over to the box attacks and i'm gonna kind of lay my head in there okay bro what do you want me to do i said i want you to give me a good boot to the other side of my face hey, okay bro i said you really got to lay it in you had to tell terry now because he'd lost that instinct you sure about that yeah, i'm sure and there's something that i've called the uh instantaneous Foley risk reward ratio analysis that tells me whether or not a certain move is worth doing. And it hurt to get, you know, boom, boom, you know, so you got the boot, the tax, but I got up and you do that. You all, you in pro wrestling, you work in a semicircle or in this case, a full circle where I sold my way around, making sure that every part of the audience could, uh, could see, see that what, visual. See what just happened to you. And you, I got that 360 degrees of, oh, 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 and I thought this was so worth it because there have been other things you do where it's like, nobody, you know, up until the UFC came around in 95, nobody knew what hurt and didn't hurt because we hadn't been conditioned that way, wrestling fans. And uh -huh. so a lot of times if you were working a hold in Japan, they knew. But in the United States, people have no idea what that hold was supposed right, to be doing and right. why. Maybe you have a commentator explaining it to them, but, you know, it did a lot for us. Well, it also, you know, it had made us have to, you know, work harder to reach that bar you guys had uh, set for us. But uh, something like tax in the face, that's pretty universal. And so I thought, yeah, that was that was worth it. I only did that bump once, but it was uh, it was worth the response we got. Oof, yeah, Don and I are like shaking heads. I, I don't know about that one. <laughs> that was uh, that, literally that was a crazy. I remember, okay, on that tour, I think there was like ten days in there, and I think there was like six, six or seven different shows. I remember, yeah, yep, that. I, 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 I'm there on this tour with, with, with you guys, and like every day I'm going to the gym. 
and I that that, that by each night I'm going to I'm, I'm just at, at the different at, at the different shows just sit, really just just watching the show because I was really involved in one show and that's actually at the Kawasaki Deathmatch tournament at the baseball field. And that even that just to see the the parade that of all the people that, that came in on it that was just, that was just so insanely crazy that, you know it was so many people there and I kept thinking as I'm walking out there to go geez don't don't trip and fall down now there don't, wait, 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 this this will ruin your career if you trip and fall down That's right Terry uh, Terry Funk came out on a white stallion uh, yes I came out holding yes. a I hold it across a barbed wire not realizing the you know the blank storm I'd be getting for for that even 25 years after the fact should have thought that one through this is just me trying to be agreeable they said cactus is on and this is for you and I said okay looks good I didn't say wait a second this is a major <laughs> gonna... yeah I know. Well, well, it's, yeah. It's, at the time you you look at it it's work and you're trying to you're trying to be <laughs> as, as a, uh, obliging as one could possibly be me now, okay, but uh, the, the funny part is like there was like one. You guys had like one day off, and I remember you coming into the, you came into the gym, and, and you're sitting there and you're just watching me, but you're being very quiet and you're just watching all the things I'm doing, stretching. And I'm going through all my my uh, shadow wrestling and shadow boxing right. and things of that nature, just going through all the stuff. And then 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 you finally you said, Dan, he goes, w- would you show me? Will you show me some moves? Yeah. And I and I I, I pause and I might go on. I go, but I go, but but you're you're your cactus jack. I go, I said, you've been doing this way longer than I am. I go, I go, what could I possibly show you? And and and, and, and you made the comment, you said that you you have a great threshold for pain. You you you, you actually said, I can't wrestle. I said, but I, I have I, I've got a great threshold for pain. And I'm going, what? And I started and I started watching your matches after that. I'm going, by God, the guy's right. <laughs> I mean, he can't incredible wrestle. Incredible threshold. Incredible <laughs> threshold for pain. Okay. I would. I wouldn't want to be a part of any of these matches that that you had. Well, you know what, Dan? I saw the writing on the wall based on what you guys were doing, and I knew that we'd have to start incorporating stuff. Now, I didn't know I was going to get the phone call from uh, Mr. McMahon a couple months after that uh, death match, and uh, Mr. Asano was our boss. Sorry, we're leaving the the, the predator out here with nothing Don't to worry, say. I'm watching. Uh, uh, so I, mean, I, I kind of felt like if I go back, um, and even even in the all, in the IWA Japan stuff, if I can incorporate a little bit of that, and the more of it I understand and can do, that even if I don't do it offensively, if I can work with people who do that, then that makes me an all. I wanted to be the guy that everyone liked to work with, who would walk away and go, all right, you know, like he, his stuff looks crazy, but he takes care of me. That was. Really important to me that I was somebody that didn't take liberties or didn't cost anybody a day at work. You know, I wanted the stuff to be physical and look good, and I and I liked yes. uh, when it was laid in. But uh, you know, nobody wants to have you know teeth broken or jaw broken or ribs or collarbone things that are going to cost you time away from uh, uh, from business. Yeah, I know you've I've asked this before, but again, I, I'm curious when you look at your various characters. What was character? Uh, take us through like chronological order. Like, what was was Dude Love the very first character? That Dude you ever Love was a, he was a figment of my imagination when I was seventeen and eighteen years old. Uh, was not rejected by a, a young lady who felt like the love of my life at that time. wasn't outright rejected, but she did call me the wrong name uh, when we uh, had the fir- our first kiss. You know, I had a lovely time tonight, Joanne. She said, "So did I, Frank." Well, at least you were in the middle of sex. <laughs> oh, yeah. You weren't, you weren't having I sex am. and your wife calls out the wrong name. <laughs> That's not the voice of experience, is it? <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> and so uh, I, I went back to my dormitory, and uh, I'm not saying this is a healthy way to deal with uh, emotional pain, but I was like, you know, a lot of people, when they can't uh, rationalize the pain they're feeling, they take it out in a physical way, which they can control. So, I mean, that's, a, you know, self-harming. That's really a serious deal. It's not as bad if you're me and you're just taking off from your uh, your bed onto a stuffed animal with a super fly leap. Uh, and that's where the story, the dude love story came in, in, in there. I created this wrestler that was everything that I wasn't, you know, self-assured and cool and a hit with the women uh 
And uh, so dude was something in my imagination that I created when I was a freshman in college. And when I became, I was driving through here looking at all the strong cactus game. The only thing stronger than the cactus game is the mustache game that you guys bring to the table. Very. <laughs> are, you growing a mustache? are you growing a mustache? Well, you know, it's, it's, people can't see it as much because it's white now. But you know, <laughs> well, we do. I remember. Uh, but, but that's but, but that's the funny part there. Just to, to pause for a second, because I always tell people that uh, I started coloring my hair at age thirty-seven. I, I was going prematurely gray <laughs> at thirty-seven, and you know, I'm that's when I started my cage fighting career. I've kept. Yeah, I know psychologically thinking if you can't walk into a cage and look across and you see, you know, someone that's going getting gray hair or something like that you're not going to be as intimidated if you color it dark and dastardly right there. Now I was like going, ooh, that's a little bit more intimidating versus white, you know. And there was so that I, I did famous part of the psychological Dan that famous quote when uh, you defeated Tank Abbott may have been the first loss the Tank suffered in UFC, and then you beat you know you had a decisive win several months later, but uh, they, uh, they interviewed Tank, and he said he had a dream that he was mugged for 20 minutes by Freddie Mercury. <laughs> yeah, he, he felt like he was being yeah, raped by Freddie Mercury. Yeah, that's exactly what he said, yes. Yeah. And that's a match that I saw on the bus there, the IWA bus, so we were keeping up with everything. And when we, going back to what you said about learning something, when I saw the Japanese magazines, you know, the rest of the pro wrestling magazines covering what UFC was doing, I was like, oh, we're going to need to pick up on this. And so I remember specifically you showing me the banana splits. Banana splits. Banana yeah, splits. Yeah, because it was, uh, and even even before UFC, I wanted to do stuff that was as wild as possible and follow it up with something technical that nobody would ever expect. So I remember yeah. uh, doing a number, you know, pretty impressive for my, you know, by my standards in 1990 because I didn't have the look and the build, you know, to strike fear into people. At least not until I came back, uh, you know, heavier and uh, and uh, more um, with more experience in '91. But in '90, I was doing a pretty good job on this guy. I even dropped the elbow off the ring apron over the guardrail, rolled him in, so he was just about, you know, uh, comatose, you know. And then I rolled him up with a bow and arrow cradle and brought him backwards for the pin. And, uh, and Jim Ross, of course, you know, made the most of that. And so I thought anything that I can pick up that puts me ahead of the curve is a good thing. And so uh, I went to, went to the best source I could find. Yeah. Jim Ross was a great, great play, oh, yeah. play color commentator. Yep. The guy could just tell a story. So do love was, was the uh, first one Then then came cactus Jack cactus Jack or, was the, Jackus Jack was the first one uh, who was a not a, a fictional character. So Cactus, uh, I, I wanted to be Dude Love. I have my first match uh, coming up June twenty eighth or twenty sixth, nineteen eighty six, and it's so it, it happens so happens that the uh, ring announcer Hank Hudson is a postal worker. So he goes, "Okay, Cactus Jack, where are you from?" And I say, "My own birthplace, Bloomington, Indiana." He says, well, "There's no cactuses in Bloomington." He, t he lists Tucson. He goes, how about Tucson, Arizona? And clearly, uh, uh, Cactus there's one or never, two here. Yeah, huh? there's a few there. And then he said, you know, I believe there's a truth or consequences, Arizona. And then he corrected himself. He goes, no, that's truth or consequences, New Mexico. I said, let's go for it. And I kept that hometown for 12 years until I became uh, mankind with WWE. Wow. <laughs> Okay, but that, now that that okay, character number three, bad kind. Yeah. Because now that way, are you bad kind? But then you also, where did you come up with the idea that I think I'll take one of my athletic socks <laughs> and put it on my head <laughs> and have my co-partner, Mister Socko? <laughs> well, it's a two two parter, a two part origin story. By the time I got to WWE, I think I was thirty. Right? Uh, yeah, maybe uh, about to be 31. And the whole idea of having a finishing move that incorporated flying off the ring apron onto the, the concrete was becoming clearly a worse and worse idea each time we went around. And besides, it wasn't a move I could do regularly at the non-televised shows. So a finishing move should be something you could do to anybody, anywhere, at any time. Jim Cornette had brought up to me the mandible claw and it had a great real-life history in that uh, Dr. Sam Shepard, 
yeah. who was the guy that the, the fugitive, the fugitive, right? Uh, whether he could not or simply would not go back to medicine, I don't know. But he became a wrestler in the southern. He worked the southern circuits for a few years, and he made up for his you know, lack of impressive physique with his knowledge of the anatomy. And he came up with the mandible claw, which is a nerve hold under the tongue. Uh, with the two fingers, and then you push up on the nerve right underneath the point of the chin, the chin with your thumb. So it was never an idea of he's sticking that sock down his throat. But now I had two years with fans seeing this move work by the time I invented Mr. Socko, which was just a way to cheer up Vince McMahon in the hospital. Um, and when the sock started getting over bigger than I was, I thought, why not just... Uh, Take the, the mandible claw that's already uh, a force to be reckoned with and put a sweat sock on it. The rest <laughs> is history. I've got a show, uh, you know, I've got a show here in uh, Tucson tonight at the House of Bards. Uh, by the time people listen to this, it's, it's, uh, it won't It'll be, be anything I can push. <laughs> It'll be burnt to the ground. <laughs> but, I, uh, but I still, 24 years later, I still bring sweat, signed sweat socks. And it's funny, if you have somebody work in the merchandise table, they go, you're selling socks? How much? Like they're twenty dollars for a pair? It's like no, just one. They, they why would you not sell them in a pair? They, it's a need to know basis. Uh, yeah, you don't. Yeah, you don't no, need I, to know. I get no. That's that's that's. that's I think that's fantastic. I mean, again, just the creativity that you had for putting something like that together. And, and again, when, when you talk about that, what episode when you came to visit uh, Vince? in the hospital and then also it's like and hey, guess who else came <laughs> you know that was that was hilarious like i said you you had a lot of fun with that that character and i mean and i you know like you said mr Sacco was getting over bigger than what you were yeah, yeah. vince yeah, vince broke character go, he laughed at that right he, he no he did he didn't laugh till oh, it yeah. was over oh. he was dead serious as a matter of fact Camera zooms in on him. At that point, Dan, when were you in WWE? When, what was your time? Um, like the, I think that the 96, 98 time okay. frame. So if you had promos, you remember they wouldn't you, they wouldn't hand you an interview to learn. They would give you some bullet points and an outline. Yes. Uh, and I guess there were instances where they would sit, tell you exactly what they were hoping to get. But in this case, it was just, I'm showing up in uh, the hospital Vince, uh, of course, he knows I'm coming. The whole goal is you got it. You have to annoy him to the point where he kicks you out. That's all we know. Uh, <laughs> he, Vince didn't even know I had the sock puppet, puppet with me. He knew I, I had a birthday party clown named Yurple coming. And uh, Yurple started stealing the show on me. Uh -oh. And uh, no matter how humble you may try to portray yourself, Nobody in the wrestling business gets into it to uh, to be outshined. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. Especially you're by you're a, looking to steal the show. Uh, yeah, you're looking, uh, you know, especially by a birthday party clown. And I was like, what do I do? She's got like 17 different props. She's got a tin whistle. <laughs> She's stealing the show on me. <laughs> the slide whistle. You know that one? Uh, so I crawled underneath the gurney. I came up with that sock and did that horrible, you know, I never gave any a, a moment's thought to how do I do a ventriloquist act. So I just said, hi, I'm Mr. Socko, and I'm going to kiss the boo-boo. You have Vince, who is not yet a billionaire, but well on his way. Go, no, don't kiss the boo-boo. And he ended up throwing us out of the room, and the camera zooms in on him, and he doesn't look to the camera. The camera zooms in and gets this close, and he goes, Mr. Socko. And I believe that was a difference I between a one and done and something that's stuck in people's minds. Uh, like I said, 24 years down the road, and uh, I'm still selling uh, sweat socks. Thank you for watching another episode of Dan and Don's Toxic Masculinity. You better like, subscribe, and share, or I'm going to come to your house.